Hey, Bridge family, we are here in Jerusalem. Actually, we are under the city yeah. of Jerusalem. That's right. And this has nothing to do with the sermon, by the way. We just think this is so cool. And it is. This is a tunnel. What tunnel is it's this? It's called Hezekiah's Tunnel. It's one of my favorite stories in scripture. It's when King David captures Jerusalem. David so badly wanted Jerusalem for Israel, but Jerusalem seemed impenetrable. It was not on a, a built on a hill and it was fortified all the way around. And they had a spring. They had their own water system. So King David comes to the walls. They're being, the enemies making fun of Israel, putting the lame up on the wall saying, you'll never get to us. King David asks for a volunteer to climb through the water system, climb through the water system and then go open up the city gates. A guy named Jehu volunteers and does this. We're about to go through that water system right now. Come on with us. You just imagine Jehu crawling through all of these tunnels. And what's waiting on the other side? Yeah, they've got an army up there. I'm thinking, Jehu, if he could see us now, he's thinking, you guys are a bunch of weedies. You're just going through a tunnel. Yeah, I had an army up there. A bunch of Jebusites waiting, but he did it. He made he it through. It. He opened the gates, and Jerusalem became part of Israel. Love the story. I want to show you another spot. Come on with us. We are here in the first century streets of Jerusalem. These would be the streets that Jesus ran around on when he was 12 years old and came to Jerusalem, came to the temple. Yeah, and we know he walked on these because right at the end of the street is the Pool of Siloam. Siloam. And he did, he did things uh, down at the Pool of Siloam as well. But I imagine Jesus walking this street pretty close to the time of his crucifixion. Yeah. Did he buy his food around here for, for the Last Supper? Did they buy around here? You know, who, who knows? But it, it's very, very possible. What kind of conversations did he have with his disciples as he was walking up these steps towards the temple? Yeah. I want to take you to some other steps, though, right outside the temple. Come along with us. We are on the southern side of the temple. Right behind me is the entrance of what would have been the temple back in Jesus' day. Archaeologists were excavating around this temple several years ago, and they came up with quite a surprise, something that they didn't know about. They found dozens of mikvahs. Yeah, what are mikvahs? Mikvahs are what we would think of as a baptismal tank. They were tanks of water that the Jews would enter to purify themselves before they would go into a holy place such as the temple. And here's what's so cool about this. In Acts, when the church launches, there's 3,000 people who are baptized and join the church in one day. Many people have asked, how do you baptize 3,000 people? Like, that takes a long time. Well, um, that is unless you have all of these mikvah tanks in the area. 70-some mikvahs. And Just like this one. This is how they would baptize. But I love imagining an early believer down here being baptized on the day of Pentecost. I imagine the line of people and the apostles immersing them. How cool would that have been to witness? Yeah. We are standing on the temple steps, the very steps leading into the temple courtyard. And these are original first century steps. These very steps, Jesus would have ascended many times in entering into the temple. Yeah, you think of Jesus as a little boy running up these steps. or at 12 years old when his 12, parents came looking for him. That's right, he was right in there. Or in Acts, uh, Peter and John, they went to pray. They went up these steps and they met a beggar and that beggar was healed. It happened right on right these here. steps. That's right. One of my favorite things about these steps is the different sizes. As you'll notice, some of the steps are longer and some of the steps are shorter. And the reason being, they did this on purpose. They made it harder for you to ascend because they wanted you to be focused as you walked into worship. And there's maybe, a, maybe you walked into worship today, you know, just a little unfocused, you know, dragging the kids to church, getting them ready. And, and, and you walk in unfocused. These steps would make you slow down and watch what you're doing as you headed into worship. You couldn't just talk and not think. You had to pay attention to where you were going and what you were doing. And there's a reason why I'm standing on this step right here. I'm a step above junior, so I, it makes me feel taller. <laughs> hey, right over there is the Mount of Olives. We're gonna head over there and talk about a story that started on these steps. Well, we're up here on the Mount of Olives. It is crazy to be up here. Like the old prophet Zechariah wrote that when the Messiah comes, when he returns, when Jesus comes back, he's going to step on this mount and it's gonna split in two, one half to the right, one half to the left. That's gonna happen one day. And our world is craving for the return of Jesus, is craving that day. But that's not why I brought you up here. I brought you up here for the view. Just down here is the Garden of Gethsemane. This is where Jesus prayed. This is where Jesus was arrested, in that very garden. It's right there. 
Over here is the temple steps. We were just on those temple steps a, a bit ago. And then to the left, you'll see a neighborhood. We were underneath that neighborhood when we were in that water shaft is underneath that neighborhood. That's, the, that's where the, David's general Jehu would have snuck through to get into the city. But what dominates the background is the gold dome behind me, right? That gold dome is called the Dome of the Rock. It's an Islamic shrine. But it didn't exist 2,000 years ago. Instead, what dominated the background 2,000 years ago was the Temple of God. It was right there. In fact, the plaza around the Dome of the Rock, a lot of it, the, the stones, the, the flooring is, is original. So much of it, not all of it, but some of it looked the way it did back during this time. A massive massive plaza and I want to tell you a story that happened in that very plaza it started on those steps that we were on but it happened in that plaza behind us it's such a good story I want to tell you it's when Mark chapter 12 is where we're going to be Mark chapter 12 if you're at the bridge and you're grabbing one of those blue hardcover Bibles in the chairs it's page 849 in those Bibles so go ahead grab a Bible Mark chapter 12 we're going to start in verse 41 let me pray God we thank you so much that we get to be right here, that we get to do this, that we get to have this in the background. Everything that happened behind us in, in, in the background, all the things that you did for us, the, the, the cross, the empty tomb, so many teachings of Jesus that, that happened, stories of Jesus that happened right behind us. We thank you that we get to get into your word right where it happened. We pray you bless this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we enter into the text, we find Jesus right there in that courtyard behind me. It's a spring day. The cool mountain air blows over the, the mountain, but the sun warms up the large cobblestone, uh, the plaza cobblestones. Jerusalem today is buzzing. A holiday approaches. Passover is approaching. And so families, pilgrims are exploring the city, exploring the marketplace. There's crowds and lines everywhere. And they all wear their thicker cloaks to, to keep warm in, in the morning, but by afternoon, it's just a little too warm for, for those. It's just one of those beautiful spring days in a very special city. The lines form by those steps that we were just on. Now, there's a bottleneck at the temple gate as people try to squeeze through, passing each other and shimmying sideways to get into the plaza. There's a bit of a rush to get into the plaza. The problem is, is a crowd on the other side of the plaza is dispersing. Those trying to get into the plaza, it's too late. Oh, they can go to the temple and they can worship and they can sacrifice. But many of them were hoping to hear Jesus teach because Jesus is in town and he's in that very plaza, but he's just finished teaching as the crowd disperses. And as the crowds go their separate ways, Jesus finds some courtyard steps and he sits down. Ah, oh, Jesus loves this area. He's loved it ever since he was a kid. In fact, when he was 12, his parents lost him in this city. And where did they find him? Right behind me in that plaza. He loves watching families come to worship. And as he people watches today, something happens. And Mark brings us in. Verse 41, Mark chapter 12. Mark writes this. He writes, As he, meaning Jesus, sat opposite of the treasury and watched the people put money into the offering box, many rich people put in large sums. So, Jesus leaves the large courtyard area and he goes to the treasury area. Now, as you can see, the treasury area doesn't exist today. Rome would have knocked that down in 70 AD. But so just imagine it with me. It would have been a smaller courtyard within a larger courtyard. And it's an even better place that people watch. The offering boxes here are pretty entertaining. In fact, it was a well-known attraction throughout Israel, the temple offering boxes. You have to go to the temple courtyard and watch the temple offering boxes. Because the temple offering boxes, they weren't just boxes. What they did was they attached the, the ends of trumpets onto boxes. So when you gave, you would put your offering into the trumpet ends. Now, you got to remember, their currency was all coins. So are you picturing or maybe you're even hearing what, what would happen? All these simple boxes with trumpet ends sticking out, and you toss your coins in, and they clink and they clang around and make all this noise before it fell into the box. Now, we're not quite sure why the, the, the temple did this. Some think the temple did this to illustrate that our giving is a, is a song, is a noise that, that God would use. The money hitting the trumpet being a sound of worship to God. And that's a cool thought. I love that thought. Others think that the temple did this to encourage more giving because it created some competition. You know, you, you get in line to give and, and you want your offering to make a lot of noise. The more noise means the more money you gave. It's like, oh, look what the Jenkins gave today. They really came packing. Did you hear their offering today at the temple? Maybe it was a thought of, maybe they did it for worshipful noise. Maybe they did it to create competition. Who knows? Maybe it was both. Regardless, 
it's a very fun place to sit and people watch. The dumping in of coins after coins. This is exactly why Jesus sits here. He's just watching. Watching the families. Watching the givers. Watching their sacrifice. He probably did this as a kid. Hearing all the clinking and the clanging is sure to invite a curious mind. It's just a great place to sit and, and watch. Maybe even make a game out of it. You know, kind of guessing whose offering is going to make the loudest noise. Oh, this next one. Watch this one. This is going to be a big noise. You see her purse? That's a high-end Persian purse. This is going to be a big sound. Hey, I was right. Listen, you hear that? Or, or wait, here's another one. Do you see his sandals? Those are like custom premium leather. And he's got that insignia on it on his cloak. Here comes another big one. No, wait for it. It's like, oh, well, that wasn't as loud as I thought it'd be. So there's Jesus sitting on those steps. He's quiet. He's in thought. He's just observing, taking it in. Not much has changed since he was a kid. And somehow, as a 30-year-old something, he's, he still loves to just sit here. It's a little detail in the text, isn't it? Jesus sitting right here. Just this little detail that's so easy to read past in the text, but it gives us this big theology. Why would Jesus sit down here? Why would Mark record that Jesus sits down here? And the reason is, is God loves generosity. That's point number one in your notes. If you're taking notes, God loves generosity. The Apostle Paul wrote that God loves a cheerful giver. And you can see that with Jesus sitting down there. He loves seeing generosity. So much so that he's choosing to sit and watch. Now you think about that for a second. There's a lot to do this week. This is the week that that Jesus dies. In just a few days, he's going to be crucified down there. There are crowds to teach. There are friends to see. There are meals to make. There are people to heal. But despite the clock running out, despite all those things to do in Jerusalem, Jesus just wants to sit there because God loves seeing generosity in us. But you know why? He loves seeing generosity in us because our generosity comes from Him. We get it from Him. It's kind of like, it's kind of like as a parent. Do you ever see yourself in your child? No, okay, I get it. Sometimes that's not a good thing. But you ever, you ever see yourself in your child and it is a good thing? Just some, some characteristics of yourself in them and you love seeing that. There's something about that, isn't there? I think back to a few weeks ago, we were at Family Fest at, at our church. Uh, we love Family Fest. You know, our building is just packed with families and it's awesome. Like kids are all hopped up on candy and sugar and crowds and the lobby's just bouncing. I loved it. But as an introvert, after about an hour, I was getting you know, a little tired. And my middle child, Nora, she, she's a lot like me. After an hour of playing games, she had a blast. But after an hour, she came up to me and she whispered to me. She said, Dad, I, I, I'm, I think I need a break. Can we just sit in your office for two minutes? It's like, oh... I kind of see myself in her. It made me smile. Now, I watch my youngest. She's bouncing around the party talking to everybody and everybody and and their and, and their moms, just like her mom was doing. And, and I love seeing that. I get to see her mom in her. It's, just, it's fun to see yourself in your children. This is why God loves seeing generosity, because he's seeing himself in us. Now, you think about it. God has been so generous with us, hasn't he? I mean, my goodness, just behind me, just down there, in that olive grove, Jesus was, was arrested. He was taken beyond those walls. He was flogged. He was crucified for you and for me. God in flesh was so generous, he gave it all. I think that's why he's sitting down there. Just watching a piece of him and everybody in that courtyard that day. And what a thought. See, just as Jesus is sitting down there, people watching, Enjoying the sights and the sounds of people worshiping through generosity. You have to understand, so God in heaven looks down on us and loves watching you give and worship. Loves seeing your generosity. It's a small little detail in the text, isn't it? Jesus sits down at the temple courts to people watching a crowd today. Like It's like a small little seemingly insignificant detail. Mark, why'd you tell us that? Yet it gives us this big theology. God loves watching you be generous. It is your worship. See, just like that, just like down there in the temple courtyards that day, in the offering boxes, just like that day, you and I are giving us a song. Oh, yeah, okay, we don't come to the bridge and throw our money into trumpets. You know, we, we cut checks or we give online, but it, it's still a song. I mean, throughout history, giving has always been this major part of worship from God's people. I mean, from Adam's family to Abraham to Moses to David to Jesus to the early church, worship was giving. 
Now today we, we don't feel that you know as much. We don't think of it that way as much. Like if I were to say, hey, in a second we're going to worship, we would think, oh, okay, I guess in a second we're going to sing, which singing is absolutely worship. It's a great form of worship. But we have to understand from the most part of history, when people heard, hey, let's go and worship, they thought, oh, we're going to go geth. That's what we do. Because when you go to the temple, you go to those trumpet boxes, and then you go, you make a sacrifice. We're, a big part of worship is giving. It's generosity. This is what God loves watching. Oh, He loves watching us sing. We should sing. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Sing. It's a great part of worship, but don't be confused. Worship is also giving. God loves sitting and watching us give. Let's get back to the story that's happening down there. Are you picturing it? Crowds down there, they're growing thick. From out of town, pilgrims. The lines are, are long. Conversations are happening everywhere you look. Maybe even people are getting frustrated by all the lines and all the crowds. The little kids are holding on to their parents' robe as they wait in line. And they're mesmerized by the sound of those trumpet boxes. But Jesus probably smiles looking at them. I remember being a kid and watching that too. In the midst of all the mayhem and the activity though, Jesus catches sight of a little old lady. She hobbled up those steps and slowly into the plaza, clutching a little pouch. You can see that life hasn't been easy for her. Her tan, wrinkled face shows her money has been hard earned. Husband hasn't left her much, if anything. And despite her physical exhaustion, she's made the walk up this hill today. Up those steps and she waits in line leaning on her cane to relieve her tired legs, clenching her little purse, slowly limping forward as the line moves and periodically wincing from her stiffness and arthritis. And Jesus is sitting across, sitting on some steps. And he gets his disciples' attention. Hey, guys, guys, watch her. Watch this one. Verse 42. A poor woman came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. Now, the original language isn't penny. It's, it's the closest we have. What she gave was actually smaller than a penny. In fact, I have a widow's mite on my, on my desk. Dang it, I forgot it. It's on my desk. And the reason I forgot it is because it's so small. It's such a tiny little coin. It was the smallest currency of its time. It was hardly worth anything. It's almost, it's almost a joke. In fact, if you wanted to go into first century Jerusalem and, and earn a mite, it's six minutes worth of work. That's all you have to do. Six minutes worth of work to earn a mite. Now, she's bringing two, so she's got 12 minutes worth of work on her. And you know she's standing there in line just dreading giving. No doubt the family's in front of her dumped piles of coins and... <laughs> piles of coins, far greater than what she has in her little purse. She slowly hobbles up. Clink. Clink. Face probably red from embarrassment turns around and hobbles off. And there's Jesus on the steps watching. His eyes stay on her as she makes her way toward the exit. Meanwhile, the disciples are looking at each other thinking, why did Jesus tell us to watch her? What? Verse 43, And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, that poor widow has put more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. Oh, the sounds today are cool, weren't they? People giving to God, creating worshipful noise, people dumping in all these coins. But those two little mites, those two little clinks, oh, that was the crescendo of today's worship in the plaza. That little old woman over there, she outdid them all. Well, the disciples look at each other confused. They're trying to make sense of this. An awkward silence falls over them, and so Jesus points to the crowd and he says this. He says, For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all that she has to live on. Sitting there on those steps, people watching, Jesus just revealed something incredible about God. God doesn't do accounting like you and I do. Because to us, you think about it, to us, piles of coins in front of her, it's worth way more than those two little mites. I mean, come on, how could it not? That's just logic. The more money, the bigger gift, that's just math. That's how we think. But Jesus says, hey, I know you look at amounts, God doesn't because, and it gives us our second point, straight from the mouth of Jesus, right down there in the plaza, second point, straight from the mouth of Jesus, percentage sign over dollar sign. Percentage sign over dollar sign. God measures generosity and percentages, not bottom line dollar amounts. And here's the reason, because God doesn't need your money. 
He doesn't need your money. Everything is his. Psalm 24, 1 says the earth is God's and everything in it, everything you see behind me, all of Jerusalem is his. He's just, he's not impressed by amounts. Now we are, we're impressed by rich. We're impressed by lots of zeros. We're impressed by big amounts. He isn't. God doesn't carry a wallet. God doesn't care about currency. God doesn't use currency. God doesn't look at, at, at the dollar signs. He's looking at percentage signs. And the reason being is percentages show sacrifice. That's what God wants to see. He wants to see sacrifice. You think about it. God who sacrificed everything for us enjoys seeing sacrifice in us. That's why generosity has way more to do with percentages than dollar amounts. I learned this principle a few years ago. When I graduated college, I had no debt. And that was a goal of mine, thanks to my, my parents helping helping pay for, for college and, and, and me working. I was able to graduate with, with no debt. And that was my goal. I, I especially wanted that because I, I wanted to marry Nicole right after college. And I didn't want this like immediate burden of a debt, you know, for my new wife. And not that it had been wrong. It was just, that was my goal. But a few years after being married, I decided I wanted to do grad school. I wanted to go to seminary. And, and, and we had a, a little one at the time. And I just couldn't swing paying for it as I went, like with undergrad. And so I took out a school loan, not, not the end of the world, you know, but took out the school loan, finished school, had a school loan, no big deal, annoying, but that's just life. An, an older friend of mine, a more well-resourced friend, found out that I had a school loan and, and they sent me a check. It was a sizable check that, that pretty much paid for, for my seminary degree. And I got the check in the mail and of course I was ecstatic. And so I called him right away. I was like, wow, you know, thank you. So I'm blown away. I can't believe this. This is incredibly generous. You know what he said? He said, nah, you know, I have no idea if that was generous or not. You don't know what I own. It could have been nothing for me at all. Junior, it probably wasn't as generous as you think. It kind of took me back. I was like, okay, well, thank you. But then I got to thinking, all right, that's, that's true. He's right. To me, that's generous because that's a lot to me. But to him, it's different. This is exactly what Jesus is getting at down here. Don't measure, don't measure generosity by amounts. Those two little mites are the crescendo of today's worship in the temple courtyard. It's all about sacrifice. Sacrifice measures generosity. Which begs the question, are you sacrificing? Is your worship sacrificial? Now, the people down there, they're putting their offering into trumpets. They're giving at least 10% of their income. This is what God has asked them to do. It's an Old Testament law, 10%. In fact, we use the word tithe, you know, tithe. That, that means tenth, the tenth. The law that they were under was, you know, you give of your first fruits, the, the first, the best, goes to God, and, and one-tenth of their income goes to God and his community. It's their worship. It goes to their giver, which seems like a lot. You know, talk to people, it's like, wham, one-tenth, that's like a big line item on the budget. It's like, yeah, it does seem like a lot. But then if you think about it in the context of who we are, like you and I, we are under God. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. God is the giver. Like we like to think of ourselves as, you know, we're earners or we're picking ourselves up by our bootstraps. Nah, come on. God is, God is the giver. We like to think of our earnings as ours. But if we're truly servants under God, all of our hard work and earnings should go to that who we serve. I'll tell you, one of the things that Nicole and I, we love about our church, we love about the bridge, is we love sacrificing alongside you. We love sacrificing and, and giving and worshiping alongside so many wonderful families in our, in our church. In fact, one of our friends has a really cool story about their giving. Dan and Liz Hart, they're such a great family. Nicole and I, we, we, love, we love doing church with this couple, love being friends with this couple. You have to hear their story. So we grew up differently. Um, I grew up at what is now the Bridge Community Church, spent my whole life there, and my parents really instilled from a young age how important generosity was, how important giving was, and that giving to the church was the first thing they were going to do. Um, I saw them make sacrifices even to continue to give to the church, and that was really just what I saw my whole life growing up. And I grew up in the Catholic Church, and giving for my family was putting five dollars in this little white envelope and then passing the bucket. And I don't know why it was always five dollars, but it was always whatever you had in your wallet at the time. Yeah, and when we first started dating was just after I had graduated college. I had just first gotten my first post-college job and was, was really actually making money at that time. And we started taking financial peace really when we first started dating. And so we sat down really early on and talked about, you know, what is giving going to look like for us? And now that we're actually going to make those decisions going forward, it's not what our parents have taught us. It's what are we deciding together is what are we going to do going forward? Yes. And you came to me and said, this is what the Bible says. We were taking financial peace. And he said, you know, it's 10% of your, of your income. And I was like, 
this number. It's it's so big, but you know, it was what God said to do, and we wanted to be faithful. We in in what he said so Mm -hmm. and it was a really tangible way where we got to see you know this is this is obedience to the lord is we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and give this really without making any other decisions or knowing what's gonna happen from there and fast forward to today so nine years later um we're here we have about to have our fifth boy yeah it's kind of wild still still is (laughs) but so as as we're looking ahead to we have we have five boys we continue to stay faithful in this uh, really this whole time and we've we've gone to one income and, and you stay home you raise the boys no one's paying you unfortunately to <laughs> no, homeschool all no. the boys uh, but we've continued to just practice generosity and practice that faithfulness really this whole time and this was early on making that decision and we've never really looked back from that and you know we don't go on as many trips we don't go out to eat as much um, we live in a small house the boys are sardined in one room but man we got we get to see the bridge go from one campus to three mm-hmm. we've got to see just we got to be at the groundbreaking at ranhurst and now there's three services and they're filled and it's just there's no amount of money there is no trip there is no car that is cooler than seeing that got at work and lives mm-hmm. changed yeah we get to see all these testimonies we get to see these baptisms um, we get to see you know something we've given towards being used really to honor the Lord and we just see lives changed and that's something that we're grateful that we've gotten to be a part of and we're grateful that we've gotten to put our money towards that and that's really a blessing to us in the sense of we're giving that money but we're really seeing the fruit of that in really cool ways and the ways people's lives have been changed. Yeah and and the cool thing about giving I think and trusting the Lord with your money is that this is the Lord's so when you give to the Lord and you trust him with your money, money doesn't have this hold on you anymore. It's it's kind of free. You you trust him with it and just see the amazing things he's going to do. So it's it's not our money, it's his and money doesn't have this hold on us that we don't have to spend all our time worrying and stressing and thinking about it. It's it's a, it's a way to give up a little bit of control and you really gain a lot of trust in the Lord through that. And so now as we look ahead, you know, generosity was something that my parents were always really big on teaching us. I remember when I got my first allowance that my parents sat down and said, and here's the portion that we give to the church and that we give to the Lord. And that was right off the bat really being taught about about giving and about tithing from from day one. And that's something as we look at our five boys that we want to be able to instill in them and teach in them so that they really see that generosity isn't just something we talk about, but it's something that we're going to live out and something we're going to continuously do. And so we can really show that to them and, and point them there in the future. I love that. I love their story. And I love hearing those stories because it inspires me. We're doing this together. Giving often hurts. It often hurts. But you think about it, that's the point. It's the sacrifice that makes generosity. It's why King David, he said, I won't give to God that which costs me nothing. David said, my giving must hurt. It must be a sacrifice. It's exactly why Jesus sitting down there, he says, it's all about percentages, guys. Because percentages show sacrifice. True, true generosity is felt. It's going to hurt a bit. For that poor old widow hobbling down those steps, it hurt a lot for her. Now I wonder what happened to her. The text doesn't say. I wonder what happened to that lady. And Jesus sat there. It, it, Mark doesn't say that he chased after her. It's likely Jesus just sat there and watched her walk off. Same thing's going to happen with us when, when we give in our generosity. God doesn't chase us down to congratulate us and shake our hand. He, he just watches for now. He just watches. And today she carefully and slowly walks down those temple steps. She takes a right and makes her way through a crowded street. All the while she's thinking, I hope nobody paid attention to my two little embarrassing clinks, my two little mites. Oh, but in reality, God himself saw and took pride. But she has no idea. She shuffles down that street. She walks past the marketplace. Her eyes catch some bread. She could have used those two little mites for some bread tonight. But she's got nothing left on her. As her stomach rumbles, she makes her way around the corner, down the hill, back home. Did she eat that night? I I don't know. If that's all she had, probably not. She sacrificed everything and no doubt felt it. She gave all that she had. 
And in a few days, Jesus will too. In a rock quarry not too far from where that widow is staying, God will give everything as well. Oh, that widow will hobble home hungry tonight. But because of the man sitting on the steps in the courtyard that day, she will one day run to her reward. And she will hear her creator say, that's my girl. That's my girl. Those two little clinks in the temple that day. Wow. What a worshipful song. Somewhere down her somewhere down there, her, her cupboards are empty. But up there, a fully stocked reward beyond her wild imagination awaits her. And so we ask, so what? Boy, is that sad as we come onto God's word? Like, man, God's word is so good, especially when you're right here, right? God's word speaks. It's like, okay, how does this change me? How does this change what I'm doing? The question I want to throw your way is, is, is your worship sacrificial? Oh, we love singing. We love worshiping. We have great worship. We have great singing in our church. But what about giving? What about giving? Are you participating in a major part of worship? Are you giving? And is it a percentage? Have you, have you seen generosity that way? I, it's a percentage. Not a dollar amount. I have to look at this the way God looks at this percentage. And are you feeling it? Does it ever hurt? God loves generosity. And generosity is sacrificial. And sacrifice hurts. This is what Jesus taught us from right down there. We're going to take some time just for some reflection, as we always do, corporate reflection, to sit in that question, is our worship sacrificial?